Welcome to the next session, which is the catchily named Disciplinary Approaches to Conservation Geopolitics Session 2. First of all, we have Professor Cameron Hepburn, who is the Director of the Smith School of the Enterprise and the Environment here at Oxford. He has loved nature since growing up in Australia and he instinctively realised that for effective conservation you need an interdisciplinary approach. And he is really well placed to bring those different perspectives to the table because he has degrees in law and engineering and a doctorate in economics. Here he's going to look at the bigger economic picture in conservation, the economic drivers and hopefully some economic solutions as well. So welcome Cameron. Thank you very much. I happen to be absolutely hopeless at pub quizzes, as it turns out. Um, and despite that, I'm proud to say that my team continually wins the local school pub quiz because I've got such good friends who have just, yeah, anyway. So maybe if I'm the answer, I don't know what the question is. Or, um, so I'm here to talk to you about economic drivers and solutions. Solutions is probably too strong a word, uh, but, you know, potential approaches to conservation. And... Um, you can probably hear that I'm a bit, well, those of you who know me will know that I've got a cold. Uh, if you don't know me, you don't know that I've got a cold, so I'm telling you I've got a cold. My voice is normally not quite um, so low. Uh, what I wanted to do with you is um, first advertise this talk. If you're Oxford-based, which I know many of you aren't, um, thank you for coming far and wide. And I should say congratulations to David and the team for having successfully got so many high-powered people here. But if you are Oxford-based, um, you will have possibly noticed that in the spring statement, the Chancellor announced a major review of the economics of biodiversity on the scale of the Stern review of the economics of climate change. We funded, to the same extent, 20 Treasury officials, um, lots of external input, FCO pushing it. And uh, Professor Sapatha Dasgupta will be leading the review. And uh, he will be giving the fourth Adrian Fernando Memorial Lecture in this room uh, on May the 16th, so do come if you're here and interested. So I'll set out the initial questions and themes. Right, so for um, you today and for me today, I wanted to talk about these five areas in my allotted time uh, and see if I can do it. So the problems of mispricing nature, the drivers of habitat and species loss and leakage and then some economic approaches to trying to minimize the damage, as I say, solution's probably too strong a word, uh, and then particularly with a quick, quick look at demand substitution as a strategy, uh, and I see Charles Godfrey in the audience, um, and some of his expertise and others on artificial meat and innovative proteins. So, um, I think you're probably aware that economists, the way we think about the problems of environmental protection and conservation, is uh, that there's no price on the relevant bits of nature that we want to protect, and it's because there's no price on it, or one of the reasons, is that we, uh, we, we end up, because of that reason, we end up not protecting it enough. And a straightforward, in theory, solution is to start to price it better. Now, if I, if I had longer with you, I'd point out that We've been concerned about peak this and peak that for a very long time. Peak oil, peak copper, peak tin, peak, you know, you name it. We're running out of minerals. Well, you don't run out of those minerals because the market and the price system works to ensure that we conserve those resources, we switch away from them if they're getting too scarce, we protect them, etc. And we don't have those sorts of powerful price mechanisms um, for conservation. So that's, in some sense, the fundamental problem. And then getting the values of uh, nature into our economic system and into our economic policy making into the treasuries of the world and into the wealth accounts is part of the challenge. And we've been pursuing this agenda uh, at Oxford by trying to get um, uh, wealth accounts more comprehensive and including more nature. And one of the things that you do when you start to do wealth accounts is that you find that um, largely across the board here, there is a correlation, not necessarily causation, but some kind of correlation between being wealthier, having more human capital, and also having more valuable natural capital. So the story of development is not necessarily a process of just trash your natural capital and you'll get rich. It's actually a process of adding value to your natural capital while you add to your education base, your skills base, and your produced uh, capital as well. So, I mean, this beautiful theatre 
is an example. It's facilitating the increase of social capital as we get to know each other, the exchange of ideas and human capital. It's built on useful natural capital, but also with the architects and the engineers that have put it together. So you need a balance of these capitals to make a wealthy and prosperous economy. Uh, prosperity is not a story of just trashing your natural capital. The problem, as I said, is that when, when you don't account for nature and conservation through the economic system, uh, the value doesn't get seen, and when it's not seen, it's not observed and decisions get distorted. So that's kind of Econ 101. I know you had a, an Econ 101 from Kate earlier today. I'm not sure there's necessarily a threat to nature. I'm not sure what she said. But, uh, but certainly there's some elements, elements of it that are quite useful. So what are the drivers of habitat and species loss? I'm conscious that probably many of you know this better than I do. Uh, but it seems from the, my cursory reading of the literature and what I've learnt over the last few years that these are your three big categories, crop, crop farming, logging and livestock farming, are driving habitat loss which is then uh, driving uh, species loss. And so if you're properly concerned about conservation then you start to look for the drivers and you ask what you might do about the drivers. So let's start there. Uh, you can drill into these a little bit further uh, and to break them down into their component parts, but effectively the fundamental drivers are the provision of humans, uh, hu humans providing for themselves with food, uh, with other goods and services, with energy related services and um, uh, a, a range of other products. And so, you know, if your driver is human prosperity, in some sense, where well, we need to make sure that we're delivering human prosperity in a different way. Now, I'm going to come on to that in a moment, but the, the starting point I want to say is that biodiversity and conservation has not been winning. I mean, we, uh, our efforts to protect biodiversity have not been hugely successful, it's fair to say, in the last few decades. And that's, this is in a context where you've got 7 billion people on average consuming or producing 10,000 US dollars per capita. That's kind of the pressure on biodiversity as it stands now. 70 uh, trillion um, US dollars per person. As we move towards 2050, it's likely that that pressure gets scaled up by at least a factor of two, because we go from 7 billion people to 9 billion people, and GDP per head probably, all being well, no collapses of human civilization, rises from somewhere in the order of $10,000 per person up above 20 and towards 30, if not even above $30,000 per person. So the economic drivers are, are fundamental, they're already substantial, and they're rising by at least a factor of two as we go forward. I don't want to kind of be bleak about it, but let's be honest about the, the scale of the challenge that we are, are facing. And just to put one of these drivers into perspective, if we zoom in to meat consumption, uh, you can see how this has changed over the last 50 years across different regions of the world and globally how it's projected to continue to increase. Now that, might, that projection may not actually turn out to be true. I'm rather hopeful that it won't and probably like some of you here, uh, there's, there's work to be done to try and ensure that this projection is false. Uh, but, uh, but all the same, uh, it goes to, to this fundamental point that the drivers are, are fundamentally adverse. And on top of that, we have, of course, a major climate challenge to address. It's not the challenge we're thinking about directly today, but we are simply not on track to get to two degrees, let alone one and a half degrees. And if you're going to get somewhere between two and one and a half degrees, we need a lot of negative emissions. To get a lot of negative emissions, we are likely going to have to make some choices that probably use more land and hence use more habitat potential uh, so, you know, either we're using something like bio, bioenergy uh, with carbon capture and storage, or we're using direct air capture and storage, and the choices we make between those sort of pathways have very major consequences for the land that is required and hence not available for other things. If you look at the land required to sequester 1 to 10 gigatons, which is probably the order of magnitude needed, uh, with bioenergy, enhanced carbon capture and sequestration, you're talking about the, you know, the entirety of California being devoted to growing crops for, for carbon and energy uh, use, or the entirety of Europe. So these are not necessarily small land areas. Uh, whereas if we choose to go down, I'm not advocating direct air capture, by the way, it's got its own problems, there's no easy wins here. But in terms of the land use pressure, 
there, there are big choices to make between different technologies that will affect how much room to, to maneuver we have on, uh, on other fronts, whether it's food or, or conservation uh, or, or water, etc. So some major choices. Now, um, this slide starts to point towards what I'm going to say as a, as, as a broad strategy, uh, solution strategy. If you look at the difference between um, Africa and Asia in their uh, agricultural production over a period of decades, Asia uh, over here has this much la land area deployed to production and it's increased fairly dramatically its yields per unit of land area, delivering a, a very large scale-up in uh, overall output, agricultural output. Africa has had a similar scale-up in agricultural output over that period, but it's done it with relatively little change in yield and, and a much changer area of land, much greater change in the area of land under cultivation. I am dosed up on drugs, but I'm still struggling a little bit here to have my usual fluency, but I hope I'm, I'm managing to some degree. Um, so the, the point here is that you've got a trade-off between using more um, land area and using more intellectual and other inputs in, in delivering the scale-up of the food that we require. And again, I'm not necessarily saying this is the right way to go, the intensification of agriculture and the use of the sorts of bits and pieces that go into making this system function are not without their drawbacks either, but there are some fairly important um, choices. Right, let me very quickly talk about something uh, that economists love called leakage and then get on to the solutions and, and wrap up. So one of the uh, fundamental uh, challenges I think in many of the historical approaches to conservation ha has been that they have only addressed the what we might call the supply side of this overall macroeconomic picture. If, if we protect particular land areas and particular species then we hope in some sense to just push back this pressure of demand coming at us from n billion humans uh, and to hold it at bay. The challenge is that the demand is there, it's powerful, it's not going away. And, and unless we satisfy it, 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 it will remain there and it'll find its own way of being satisfied. So you can protect one area or you can protect one forest, but uh, humans are clever and we have a habit of getting around these problems and leakage in this sense is, is the way that you protect one area and the forest that you protect, well, it just gets knocked down somewhere else in order to meet the demand. So my strong point, I hope, today is to leave you, not, not by saying that supply-side measures are not valuable, protected areas are not valuable, they are, but it's we, do need, we need to have to think quite strongly about the demand side as well. And that's not just reducing demand, because it's kind of possibly unrealistically hopeful to ask everybody to consume less, and I guess you would say, well, I'm a boring old economist, real people will consume less, but so far history doesn't suggest that you can get massive reductions in... Uh, in, in consumption just by asking people not to consume more. The better off, I think, or the better approach is to meet those demands in a way that is environmentally sustainable and leaves a space for nature. So, so how might we do that? Um, and how might we meet a target such as the UK's target of net environmental gain or, or no net loss uh, of nature? Uh, well, we, we, along with my colleague Dieter Homer a few years ago, we decided that this would be rather a good question to ask and to research and as we didn't really know any of the answers ourselves we thought we would edit a book that collected up all of the best scholarship and the best answers on this question uh, and after doing all of that we decided a few things uh, that actually biodiversity and the economics of biodiversity is, is really strongly under research so I'm very glad that we now have a stern review on uh, the economics of biodiversity and I was just talking to Nick Stern today this morning and he is extremely keen about this too and um, I think we're all <coughs> glad that Partha is going to do it because he brings incredible depth and intelligence in, in this area. Um, but so core conclusions, um, we are from an economic point of view fairly obviously beyond the point at which further destruction of biodiversity is welfare enhancing but we are going to do it unless something changes. We are trying to stop ourselves. We're spending billions every year on conservation efforts to stop ourselves. But what we don't do properly, in, except in very rare cases, 
is design these interventions so that we can know after the fact what has worked and what hasn't worked. So they're not designed to have a control and a treatment. The basic standards of scientific research in so many other fields somehow um, seem to be you know, the really min absolute minority exception rather than the rule in, in this area. And if you make policy in advance so that it can be evaluated ex post, yes, you know, as one minister was told by his special advisor in front of me, but um, that would tell us whether we were whether we'd made a bad decision or not, I don't think this is a very good idea. Yes, it is a problem uh, politically, but it also enables us to um, <coughs> possibly make some progress. So that's a, that's a first strong conclusion. The second one is that you have to take quite a lot of care here. Saying, uh, well, you know, I saw an economist once, he said we should pay for nature, so let's just pay for ecosystem services. Because isn't that, that's pretty good, that'll sort of sell us out. Well, Payment, paying for ecosystem services is no bad thing per se, uh, but the alignment between paying for ecosystem services and the protection of biodiversity isn't one to one. It doesn't necessarily yield greater protection of biodiversity if you are paying for the sorts of human focused services that we want, whether they're clean water or, um, or you know, um, more um, nutritious food or, or what have you. Um, so, what this thought about, let me just whiz through there, what, what this point about leakage leads us to, is a, or leads me to at least, is a few uh, conclusions or tentative directions. The first is that this sort of event is very valuable because leakage means that if you do something somewhere without thinking about the whole system, you're going to cause some adverse consequence somewhere else. So you do need to have an overall internationally collaborative and politically mediated approach to conservation. The second point is that um, in some areas, uh, you know, I've taken a very aggregate view here, and probably many of you are thinking, yes, but actually quite a lot of the world's biodiversity is in hotspots, and um, if we just protect the hotspots, we'll be okay. And that's actually not a, not a dumb view at all. It's a rather sensible view, really. So let's find out what we, uh, what we can afford to destroy, to put it, uh, in these terms, which I know Charles and Cathy and others from Oxford was involved with, and what we really have to protect because it's just so valuable or something that we treasure. So it may be that we just want to say, okay, there are certain areas that we're, we're simply not going to destroy, but we're actually going to destroy quite a lot of the rest of the world. Um, and then finally, how can we uh, meet the demands, whether it's using lab-grown meat or some of these other uh, innovations, uh, to keep within these planetary boundaries while also not denying growing human demands. And Charles and Marco Springman and Susan Jeb and myself and others were involved in a piece of work that was released at, the, uh, at Davos in January looking at, uh, on the protein front, how do we meet the world's protein needs with different sorts of uh, pathways, protein pathways. And you can see there, there are real choices for the world that have really major differences in outcome in terms of emissions, in terms of actually we can go on water, uh, uh, um, land use or health here. And it's pretty clear that once you do the analysis, some of these pathways are really significantly better on almost every measure than other pathways. So the challenge is then making them acceptable and even desirable for human consumption, uh, rather than just hoping that people will substitute beef for peas. Uh, as it turns out, I've eaten a lot more peas since I, we, I, we got to the bottom of this study. Um, and so, so have my children. Actually, tip for parents, uh, you can get your children to eat frozen peas. Mine now love them. You literally take them out of the freezer, put them in front of them, eat, and they do. Oh, that blew me away. So good for them, <laughs> great, great protein, minimal preparation, and I, I understand they're healthier than actually cooking them. I'm almost out of time, so let, let, me, let me wrap up. It's probably a good thing. Um, the, the lesson I want to leave you with is the, the, the kind of micro-conservation efforts of the past, where you, where you look at a particular bit of land or a particular species, um, Great, we need to win many, many battles, but I guess my core message is let's make sure we're not winning battles and losing the war. And the war here is to understand the systemic and the macroeconomic effects, the macroeconomic drivers, and hence what some of the interventions might be at that macroeconomic level.
um, uh, to, to enable space to be preserved for nature, uh, because without it, I guess, we'll, we'll lose a lot of what we, we frankly, I think we all cherish. Uh, you know, even those of us who are eating meat are at the same time cherishing the very thing that eating of meat is undermining. So it's squaring that circle um, that I, I think hopefully a bit of economics can help with. So um, hopefully that has been useful. <laughs> Any questions? So we can probably have time for one question just so we keep to time. Yeah, there is one. I hate to hog the mic, but so ecological economics has been around for a while. I mean, it, but it doesn't seem to be making much progress in terms of the sort of GDP, global economics, growth, and all the rest of that. Uh, could you just comment on that? <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, you could argue that environmental or ecological economics has been around since Aristotle, uh, and certainly since Mill, uh, John Stuart Mill, and definitely since Pigou in the 1900s. So in a sense, it's a critique of um, the fact that we're, we've got environmental problems and yet we've had people thinking about them for a very long time. So where has there been progress? Let me frame it, your question, in a slightly more positive light. Um, I, mean, I think we now understand, we've got a lot of the theoretical apparatus. Um, uh, quite a lot of that is seeing its way into uh, government policy. I mean, you could say the same things about climate change in some sense. You know, we've known about the problem for 50 years or thereabouts, and emissions went up again by 2.5% or thereabouts last year. Um, the reason I'm, I guess, optimistic on uh, climate is, I think, we're starting to get um, self-reinforcing technological feedbacks that enable us to make a transition to the sorts of uh, modes of production and consumption that will reduce emissions and then ultimately turn them negative. It's not, it's not completely implausible that late, with a lot of destruction, we get climate under control. With biodiversity and with conservation, I think we're much earlier down this line because, again, we haven't been thinking in these kind of systematic ways, what are the technologies, what is the cellular meat, what is the, you know, t to meet the human demands without pillaging um, the space that we have for nature. So it's, it's that systemic and you know, perhaps I'm a bit techno-optimist, but those sorts of areas where I think we'll, we'll make some, some progress. But I agree with your kind of premise that we're not in a great state and uh, we need to do a bit better.